Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Wren, and I'm the chair of the XTS Advisory Committee. I want to thank you very much for coming to today's session. So um, Ben and I were chatting a few months back, and he broached this term called global production support um, as an area that he thought that we should explore at XDS. And um, as he described the particular challenges of treating games as a service, it became clear that collaboration, communication, and integration between our external partners and disciplines is paramount to delivering a positive experience to our players and actually is very much in line with the goals and values of XDS. It's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's session, Mr. Ben Wiberly. Ben is a 20-year vet of the external development practice, having managed and grown significant deals for QA, localization, and live operations. Ben co-founded Babel Media and subsequently had roles at DDM and VMC before becoming his own boss at DAQA, a new generation game services company. Ben, thank you for agreeing to champion this very important topic for today. Please welcome Ben to the stage. All right, gang. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'd like to thank XDS as well for having us for this panel today. And thank you all for coming to listen to the global production support revolution. Um, I'm very proud and honored to have the panel members that we have today. As Chris said, when he and I first started talking about this, and then he convinced me that moderating the panel would also be a good idea. Um, that um, to have these panel members is absolutely awesome, and the experience that we have up on this stage is great. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some panelist introductions real quickly. Then what I'm going to do is I'm, going to, I'm not going to stand the whole time, don't worry, but I'm then going to summarize what it is that we're talking about, the overall theme of what we're doing with the panel today, and then we'll go to the questions. So that's when I'll stop talking, which you'll all be thankful for, I'm sure. Okay. So, let's start. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Darren Merritt. I'm the head of quality assurance at Riot Games. We make League of Legends. Um, I've been there about seven years now, and before that I worked with Maria at Electronic Arts. Um, so, uh, obviously, uh, we are very interested in how we work with our partners to support our global operations, so we'll talk a little bit about that today. Good afternoon. I'm Peter Cardall. I'm the head of Xbox certification for Microsoft. Uh, and good afternoon. My name is Maria radulovic Nastic, and I had a CDS, which is Central Development Services Organization in EA. Um, that's an organization that consists of uh, multiple disciplines, including uh, QA. Um, we call it quality verification. It in, in, uh, um, encompasses of quality assurance and quality engineering, localization, certification, and uh, release engineering, development release engineering. Hi, my name is Mike Martin, and I'm the Global Vice President of Quality Assurance and Localization at Blizzard Entertainment. Um, which includes uh, functional quality assurance, automation, um, certification, submissions, compatibility, um, and uh, our localization efforts in the regions. Been at Blizzard uh, 13 years this November, so I got there right after World of Warcraft launched when it was a much smaller company. So there's quite a lot of experience up on this stage. So the overall takeaway that we discussed today in terms of this panel really was enabling the audience, enabling you guys to to walk away with a business case for change, right? The business has changed immeasurably over the past five years, and that's had a real impact on how we run our business. So what we're really trying to get to today here would be like more like that strategic rather than a tactical focus. So we're not trying to get down to, although we may do, lessons from the front line. This is really more like that strategic viewpoint. Again, so you can take the ideas back and make that business case for change. So with that, I will go to the first question from left to right. What has changed and what has that impact been? Obviously, uh, when I was working, when I first started my career in games, almost 13 years ago as well, it was box product, you ship something. You sort of were like, okay, it's good. Hopefully, you know, you get a Metacritic score and you move on and, and you go to your next product. Now everything is constantly being updated. There's, we, we talked about the, the day zero and, and the constant like, pushing of content and, and, and features. Uh, when I went to Riot, obviously, um, that's a service, right? It is something that's constantly living 24-7 global, and it's a completely different mindset on how you support that. Um, so that was actually a little bit of culture shock for me at first. I was like, how do we actually do this when I'm thinking in more quantifiable releases that are clearly done, and then you move on? Um, 
So that framing, to, to change my, my mindset, I had to look at like, what do we need to do? How do we evolve our discipline? And it had to become much more of an integrated piece. You mentioned the development uh, cohesion. And it also had to extend to our partners. Our, our, our partners at vendors were also thinking of things in more of a box product fashion. And we had to work with them and say, look, we need your teams to be sustainable. We don't want you to spin up and then wind down your teams. We want people that can live with the product year over year know the product intimately, really are players of the games we make and are passionate about them just like us. So they are, and the panelists this morning mentioned this as well, they're an extension of our team. They really are a, a partner that is basically our team that we have to work with. So that, that mindset shift to always on, uh, constant healthy relationships that grow over time and our engagement uh, with the players that continually allows us to like tweak and iterate and refine the product um, is something that like completely shifted from a traditional box product to to now to where we're always you know, kind of supporting that stuff. Great. Thank you. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, one of the things that we've seen from a platform perspective on Xbox is this player retention model that you spoke to. Um, traditionally, you know, titles would have a shelf life of six months. Um, what we're seeing now is a lot more updates to keep those titles fresh, to keep player retention, and to really bring the new levels of development to the, the consumers. Um, so we're seeing a lot of titles today having multiple content updates, not only the number of those updates, but also the size of those updates. So I think the industry is changing from that perspective to bring more content to consumers and be more responsive to those changes. So question, um, what's the change? Like what changed? Everything changed. So if you think about different dimension of complexity of environment in video games. So one is that live services. So you have the fact that games are not any more packaged goods. They are basically live services. You have geo expansion, geographical expansion. It's complete now global phenomena. On the other side, it's also the way the games are played are changing. So you have augmented reality, you have virtual reality adding to complexity. You have also the expectation of quality of the players going up and up. So the complexity of that environment is growing from every day. But on the other hand, there is also opening other opportunities. So you have access to your players and you have access to enormous amount of data. So in my mind, the biggest change that our discipline in gaming industry is going through is learning how to leverage that data to provide more confidence in the quality of the product. So it's absolute complete transformation of what QA means in this industry. And just to add to that, it's very interesting to partner with external, <coughs> external groups, with par our partners, to go on that journey on how to transform the, the, the discipline towards coming closer to the player and leveraging what we learn from them. So, um, yeah, I mean, you guys have covered most of it. I think, you know, I got in the industry 27 years ago, and um, it was very simple back then. Um, the nice thing I will say about this change that's occurred when I, you know, I got to Blizzard, uh, World of Warcraft was really a website and a client server. It was a disk, you know, and uh, there weren't a lot of services for it. So um, it was the first foray into kind of like this, this ongoing live support. And the company had to shift to be um, a service provider, basically. They, they were a game developer and they wanted to become a service provider. And it, was, it took a while for them to make that shift. <coughs> Excuse me. But I think this is one of the fundamental things that has actually shifted how we do business in the game industry. Uh, as more and more people want uh, to keep their products fresh and they're not just putting them out there and knowing they're going to be out and consume for nine months and then die, right? I mean, people are investing a lot in them. Uh, we're looking at everything and all aspects of the business. And like I said, in the 27 years I've been doing this, this is probably the biggest thing that has actually shifted um, so many groups reevaluating how they're doing things. And I think we're going to get into some of that. But it, I think it was a significant um, change for the industry. So when we did our call at the beginning, there was one sort of common theme come up. So uh, 
Our responsibility is not to enter bugs, change text, or log tickets. Our job is to mitigate risk. Discuss. And I will let whoever feels strongly about this go first. <laughs> I was the one that said it. So this is one of the things that we, we tell our testers, right? Like, bugs are an artifact of what we do. Our job is to mitigate risk, report uh, what we're finding, inform the development teams. Uh, and the more technical um, people that we have on the team that can do it, or the more qualitative focused, right? Uh, we have, for example, raiders that really know the game very well. Um, and they're able to actually talk their language. And this is something that's been a pretty big shift for us, but it's really been a big focus for us because I think a lot of people, and I still get this at, at Blizzard, where the perception is that we're just there to enter bugs, and that's not our job. Our job is to mitigate risk across the board and everything um, and inform the development team so they can make the right decisions. So if you don't mind, I will add to that. <coughs> I agree yeah. 100%. Um, and one term that we use is our job is to provide actionable intelligence to development team. So it has to be, when you think about what does it mean actionable, is it has to be in the right time and it has to be precise enough so that the development team not knows what to do with it. So um, again, going back to that uh, idea of understanding data, having collecting a data that can be translated into actionable intelligence. I believe that that's the job of the modern uh, quality, quality assurance. I think also there's a maturation of the business because there's, it's not just about finding bugs that are just functional defects. There is a lot of this element of the subjective feedback that we, we've incorporated as well, um, validating whether or not this product is right for the market. Is it, is it meaningful and resonant? Is it fun, right? And that's a huge piece of the business that you're leaving on the table if you don't have people actually acknowledging that aspect. If it's just find defects, functional defects, report those, go away, that doesn't help really. That's a very antiquated look at what the business can be and leveraging data and intelligent, smart people that are immersed in the product can get you so many gains. So uh, if I have any message for the partners out there that we work with, hire people that really care about what they do or are willing to give that mm -hmm. constructive, deep, meaningful feedback on the product. It's super helpful. Hopefully, your, your, your teams that you're working with are, are receptive to it. A lot of, a lot of de developers are. Um, I think that's a, a piece that takes it from just finding bugs to mitigating risk and also providing a constructive, evaluated, like, product health sentiment, right? So, so. I think a lot of it's already been said, Ben, um, really from a platform perspective. <clears throat> excuse me. From a platform perspective, um, we went through this transition a few years back when every platform out there wants the best possible products on their platform. It's without doubt. Um, implicitly in that statement used to be this concept of, uh, well, we're going to test quality into that product then at that point. And as we all know, trying to test quality into a product just before it ships is, is a futile ex exercise. Um, so we very quickly learned that uh, we weren't in the business of QA, we weren't in the business of entering bugs, as you said. Um, we were very much in the business of mitigating risk. And for me at Microsoft, that means mitigating risk to the Xbox, mitigating risk to the live service. And the quality aspect of a title is in the hands of the publisher. So if our job is to mitigate risk, does that mean we have a tolerance for lower quality because of the ability to patch and the higher iteration of updates that we see now? <laughs> um, no. Anybody want to no. Yeah. I actually don't think so. Yeah. I, I don't think so. And, and the reason for that is because consumers today are very vocal. Yeah. And I think if you play that game, then your consumers today very quickly have uh, an avenue with which to call BS on something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think if you do that, then you'll get caught up pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah. No, I think more importantly, to your point, like um, we all know we're not going to catch everything, right? It's just about understanding what the impact is and, um, and being able to prioritize, prioritize those things. And then going back to this ongoing um, you know, development cycle, we can, we can get those things fixed. Whereas in the past, right, it was like, well, it's, we've got two patches and then that's it, the, game, the game's done. Um, uh, however, what I would say is, is that I think, you know, um, and we get that question a lot, 
getting qualified individuals that can really dig into really understanding and then explain that risk to the development team really helps. And mm -hmm. I think this is going back to kind of the point that you brought up earlier about the big shift in the industry. This is why when I got to Blizzard, I started this crusade of like evolving QA as the fifth element of development, right? Um, mainly because it had to change. And I think that today, uh, getting you're going to get what you pay for. If you want uh, minimum wage kids that are just come in, you're going to hand them a controller with no training and say, here you go, test this. You're going to get what you expect. And the games that we have today are too big, too complex. The technical challenges around these games are massive. And we know we're going to be supporting these games for five to ten years. We need those people that can go in and understand mm -hmm. and keep that knowledge over the course of years. Um, because you have to get rid of them at 12 months, then you've lost a whole bunch of knowledge. There's just we need to shift how we're doing things in the industry mm -hmm. and really help to make sure we're evolving um, for these reasons um, mm -hmm. for the long life cycle of products. Mm -hmm. I think instead of um, thinking of it as, as an ability for us to lower the quality bar and be sloppy about how we work, I think it's actually an advantage to be able to be more um, immediately like rec uh, reactive to or recognize and in some degrees be more proactive in how we respond to players sentiment so in terms of like thinking about a game that requires a lot of balance um, or t tuning you can actually deliver it to what you think is good not sacrificing quality but not really know everything you've done your your public tests and you've, you've done case studies and data mm -hmm. analysis but you're not quite sure if it's there you think it's there but by delivering and then being able to patch out some some minor tweaks you're making the product better so you didn't really lower your quality bar with this this ability you actually are raising it incrementally because it is a live product, which is really valuable mm -hmm. and useful tool that players really respond well to because mm -hmm. they're yeah. listening to them. Right. But it's interesting what's actually uh, uh, came up for us is um, no, the quality, we cannot lower the, 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 the bar for quality. That's, I completely agree with that one. But once when you're alive, there is another component of quality that's actually very interesting, and that's speed. Mm how fast you can react right. on what's happening. Mm -hmm. And that gives often player the sense of quality. Because yes, we won't, we're never gonna catch everything. And I mean, things change so fast that we'll always run into problems. But if we have ability to react on them <laughs> fast, that gives also the, the sense of quality. Yes. What preemptive work can be done, if we go back to thinking more about sort of working proactively with the development teams, what preemptive work can, we be, can be done during development with the dev team? So anything like identification of player pain points from support before game launch, what sort of things, what sort of actions can we take to work with the dev teams to, yeah. to be preemptive on that? So I, I can start with that one. So um, for long, our uh, philosophy is that the time that QA was about bug detection is actually gone, it's past. And that QA should be more about, if you want, bug and defect prevention. And maybe even moving further to bug or problem prediction with all the data that we have. So thinking about QA being fundamental part of the game development right from the beginning. So it's not something that's coming later in development process. But right there, from the develop, from the design, from the conception of the product, all the way through the development process, with again with the idea to prevent bugs because the cheapest bugs are the one that never happened. And again, the dream is to be able with data to even predict where they might be. So. Right. Yeah, that's I, I completely agree with that sentiment. Yeah. Um, to the extent that we've started investigating. Uh, in the industry, I've seen some articles on machine learning to try to get mm -hmm. predictive modeling mm -hmm. and looking at, at risk-based analysis to help exactly. us understand, like, where is our defect density? How do we actually get into a place where we can understand how we build better software and better yes. games? Um, super cool stuff, leading edge. I think that's where we should be putting our mind share. Exactly. Um, because that will be long-term so much more of a benefit to our yeah. players and, and the products we make. Yeah, exactly. So I'll quickly just tell you guys, uh, you know, we, Diablo 3 launched um, a number of years back with a little thing called Air 37, which you guys probably all remember. Um, the funny thing about that was is that it was in we, one country, one platform, and we, we had a lot of people come on, but we, we got Air 37. Um, the company stopped and really said, we need to fix this. 
and Overwatch as a result of that. Um, just four short years later, not only did we ship on three platforms uh, in every country we support um, with probably three times the amount of customers to a smooth launch, um, but we did it with one flip of the button. And that came directly from exactly what you were asking, is embedding very early on, getting QA and localization involved um, at the very beginning with the development team. I recently had a friend of mine ask me about, he's gonna start a company, he's like, should I hire a senior designer? Should I hire a senior engineer? I said, you should hire a senior QA person because no matter what you hire in the other disciplines, that one person will multiply what those other people do as well. So that should be the first thing you should hire. Um, because they'll make your artists better, they'll make your tools better, they'll make your engineers better, right? Um, that's a big investment. We gotta, we gotta flip it, which is, oh, I'm just gonna go on the cheap. No, invest there. Um, and so that's what we're seeing. And now the nice thing is, is that all the teams are, are pulling us in a lot earlier, I would say, than we're comfortable, really early. So now the problem is we don't have people that are technical enough to be able to talk the talk. And so we're going out and introducing this technical track that is bringing people in uh, that are able to sit down with the engineers at the concept phase, like just when they're blue skying things, and it's already paying dividends for us. That's a that's a really smart point. I just want to riff on that for a second because yeah. I think um, if you can hire people in your quality assurance team that understand the craft of who you partner them with, if they're design minded or they have design skills, mm -hmm. or if they're artists and they have art skills and you put them with the designers and the artists and the engineers, the programmers, they are gonna level up your artists, designers, and engineers because they're gonna have really informed, deep, meaningful conversations about how to make the product better. And they have the bandwidth to focus on that mm -hmm. craft excellence and help them tweak their, their abilities and look at their pipelines and look at how they work and, and level that up. And that is a huge benefit, mm -hmm. right? That is, that is worth the investment. Yep. I totally agree. Absolutely. I love what you said, craft. I think that Quality assurance has not really been seen as a discipline or a serious track for a long time. One of the things I give to our onboarding people is said, you know, when I started the industry 27 years ago, the average tenure of all the disciplines was around six, seven years, including QA. And so having a lead step in at five years was natural. Today, the average tenure for most disciplines is anywhere between 18 and 22 years, except QA, it's still six years. So how do I put a six-year tenured person in the industry in a room with someone who's got 18, 20, 22 years of experience and have them take them seriously? You can't, right? And so now I've started hiring people that have 20 years of experience. They're actually in the craft, in the discipline of quality assurance. And those conversations have changed overnight mm -hmm. because of that. Yeah, it's in, and it's interesting. I'm sure that you also went through, through the challenge of uh, attracting people to QA with that strong skill set. Yes. Uh, but once when we are able to tell a story of transformation, like how interesting is all the changes within the discipline, that actually unlock potential for us. Absolutely. A majority of the investment in, in people in the last few years are highly technical mm -hmm. senior engineers that have focus on quality. Yeah and now recently data analysts, data scientists, and so on. But it's, again, to your point, really people who can absolutely be the partner right. with the senior engineers or people in the industry. I think one of the, um, although I can't mention specific titles, <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the best ways we've seen um, publishers do this, Ben, is through the implementation of telemetry within the titles. Mm -hmm. True. Um, yeah. Data. Yeah. Um, we've seen a lot of titles today implement real good telemetry to understand customers, what customers are doing in their titles, and build updates to those titles way before we're expecting them to come in. Uh, and it's all down to that skill and that subtle art mm -hmm. of being able to work with partner solution providers uh, to understand telemetry, make use of that data, mm -hmm. and be able to use it to build better products. When it comes to allocating budgets, right, how do you maximize ROI? How do you maximize return on investment without using cost as your lowest common denominator? Um, I think you, you change the equation away from cost. Uh, it, I mean, everybody cares about cost, right? Like, I mean, they say they might not. Um, some companies say they do. Um, 
But even if the conversation is not about cost, you're looking at like, what are you getting for the dollar? What are you getting for the, the, the investment you're making? And so how do you maximize that? You look at um, what we changed our perspective on was like, look, I'm not looking to chase the lowest cost center around the world, right? Because I get a lot more work, but it's lower quality work and there's a hidden cost in the amount of work I have to do to filter through what I'm getting and, and dealing with communication challenges and I'm, I'm getting a service level that's not sufficient. So it's really showing people and informing people what um, the value is in the service quality being higher, right? And we focus on, we want partners who are partners, right? And this is the panel this morning talked about this and I really respect what they had to say because it is our philosophy as well. We want partners that are equals, partners that challenge us, and those partners tend to cost a little bit more, but the, the ROI is huge on that because they're leveling us up. They're making us a better uh, game development company to work with, and together we are actually incrementally getting better, and that benefits the players. So if you think about investment, if you're always just chasing, like, I can lower costs, you're missing part of the equation around we can actually get to a place where we are better at what we do, we're more efficient and effective, and we actually deliver better products to the players, and that's super important, right? Yeah. So we sort of just shifted the conversation, not neglecting costs, but looking at what you're getting for your money, right, and making sure that people understand the value. I, I think you hit it on the head. It's, you know, everyone's ha everyone has a favorite restaurant out there. Quiznos comes to mind for me, right? And I've watched over the last couple of years them focus on cost and their sandwich selection has gone down and their quality has gone down. It's, it, and it's very obvious. And if you look at most, probably everyone has some restaurant that they can put this. When they first come out that first year, they're like the best thing out there. And then five, six, seven years later, they're just not. Um, for us, it's the same thing. Uh, we are a business. I think this is one of the other challenges that we have. And this is why I like that we're having this conversation is if you, if you talk about a craft and a discipline, you also have to treat it like a business. Uh, I actually really try and push, and it's a hard thing, most of my test managers into business meetings to actually pitch to our executives. There's not a lot of companies that do that. And I think that's a problem, because right now, if I want to get a business person that could understand how, like, how to do an ROI without Googling it, <laughs> right? that's not a practice that we do a lot in the industry as a discipline. And so I think we need to bring more business focus on this. Not that we're trying to optimize costs, but just to understand where our bottlenecks and inefficiencies are, and then have them fix it. And then they will be able to explain what they're doing more. Uh, so very similar to what <laughs> both of you said, uh, I don't believe that cost is the main driver for innovating or main driver to uh, work with partners. Yeah. Um, I, I don't necessarily challenge my teams to do what they do cheaper, but what I challenge them to do, to be able to be more effective with the time that they have during development. So um, usually my story is, like when you take a product like FIFA, it's gonna be released soon, so uh, like FIFA, FIFA 18 during development phase, the main game, receives around 1.1 million hours of testing, from which maybe 400,000 is manual and around 700,000 is automation. So that's during the development cycle. Then, first five hours, when it's live, you get five times more than hours, <laughs> which means that every single hour spent on verifying the quality of your game has to be the most effective hour. So as I said many times, I don't really care about how much every hour will cost me. I'm way more interested to understand how that hour can be the most meaningful hour during development time. And of course, with that then, the, co the, the cost aspect is more what you can do for what's, what's there, rather than just trying to be a cheaper hour. Absolutely. I'm going to have to have a conversation with you guys. Okay. Mm -hmm. We don't Google stuff, we Bing it, okay? Okay, um, that's <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that was a big... <laughs> sorry. Um, or ask Cortana. <laughs> uh, it's Microsoft, Ben. We never have budget conversations. We've got tons of money. No, no. Right. Of, of course. Um, in the business of certification, where times are so short, 
and we have huge spikes in volume of traffic, uh, particularly now in the mm -hmm. holiday season with a lot of content coming through. Um, yeah, things can very quickly get out of control and you can spend a lot of money very quickly if you're not careful. Um, the way that I like to think about it is, again, to the point that's been made, it's where do you get smart? You have to get smart with the data that you have. And um, without giving too much away, I'll be talking about that later. Um, I had some other questions. I don't know whether anybody wanted to add. I mean, Mike, you touched on it a little bit. Um, <laughs> anything more on sort of that culture creation, creation of the business culture, establishment of the discipline? Do you have any more thoughts on uh, you had a question there, I actually made a point about um, how respected the discipline is in, in the industry. Um, and I just, I mean, maybe I'm naive, uh, but I think that that's something that it's, it almost we overcame that problem. So what I see, at least in EA, is the respect for quality assurance being very much different than, let's say, five or six years ago. Uh, I think that my teams are seen absolutely as equal with development teams uh, or any other service teams, which then the end result is higher quality of the experience for player. Yeah. So I think that's good. And, I, and I, I don't know, would you disagree with me, but I think as an industry, we are uh, winning that battle to be equal. Uh, thank you. I agree. Right. I, yeah. I was just going to say, I, I agree. I think it goes into the whole, like, you know, all of the disciplines have evolved like tr tremendously over the years um, and we need to keep pace with that and we need to basically at the end of the day we run a business like and we're for profit right so like we have to be thinking about that and so to your point about it, it's like adding more value like making sure that you're putting that the most value on what you're doing but also having people that will speak about it I think when you do those things what naturally happens is that respect piece comes exactly. Right? Um, if you're just kind of there to punch a clock, people aren't going to respect you and you, you know, they're going to treat you that way. But I think as we've stepped it up and started pushing people in that direction, that's been a result. Uh, and I've seen the same thing happen um, as well. It's yeah, I've seen, I've seen a lot of change. And the, the most effective change has been when we get artists, des designers, developers, engineers thinking like this yeah. and transforming their view of QA. So they're not just like, oh, this is a test group that I just throw my problems to. They're actually a partner. And they come and yes. solicit our input and feedback. It's immensely powerful. It's such a better way, way to work. My most effective leaders have been the ones that have gone into teams and helped change their mindset yeah. and transform how they look at it. So now they're like, oh my god, we have to have you at the table. Absolutely. We want you there early because you're going to help us make a better game. It's not about you're going to test it later. It's about, no, we want to hear your feedback. This is really, really um, helpful and, and beneficial to us. And getting that caliber of people throughout the industry is why I like doing these kind of talks because I like to spread that message. Those are the people you want. Those are the people that are going to transform how you work and make your products better for the long run. So it's really cool. Uh, we had your final questions. I have a question for the three of you, and then you have your own special question, oh, Mr. Gilmire. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so I've been doing a lot of um, <coughs> RFP reviews sort of on the client side recently and listening to, you know, what service companies come back with and there's a sort of the standards of w which you talk about, right, and what you'd expect if you were buying services. That's quality, that's process, it's experience, it's cost, it's location, right? That's the standard of what you're buying, right? And that's sort of what you see in the RFPs. You don't really see anything about the above and beyond. So when I'm asking this question, I'm really looking for the above and beyond. What does a panel look for when you're working with partners? Like, what, make, what makes the, that partner stand out, apart from what you expect for what you're actually buying in the first place? Um, I can jump in since I'm here. Uh, I think uh, for us, it is really a, a partner that's an equal in, in terms of thinking about the product and the evolution of the product and really understanding who we are. If I have a partner that comes and doesn't know the product we make or doesn't know the genre or doesn't, isn't engaged or doesn't really care, they're just like, hey, we can do these services for you in a very traditional way, that's not interesting. What I'm interested in is somebody that goes, I see what you're doing, I see how you work, and maybe these ideas would help you be better and make the product better for the players. That's intriguing. Or they have innovative ways of, of approaching the problem. They've got efficiency or effectiveness gains through technology or data or some kind of interesting thing that I haven't seen before. That's compelling. That's the 
you know, thing that I want above and beyond the standard status quo for the delivery, right? That makes sense. I, I think for us, Ben, it's, uh, it's two things. Uh, first, it's flexibility. Um, we have very tight timelines. And so I need to work with partner companies that are very accommodative of that, uh, of that flexibility. And the second thing um, is probably more beneficial, but it's that diversity of skills. Um, we've been embarking upon some radical changes in the processes, and the skills necessary for that actually came from the medical industry. And some of the, some of the business partners that we've been working with that have enabled us to roll this out in the games industry actually got their footing in the medical industry. And so having partners who have that vision, who can cross-pollinate those skills and help us be better as a result of that, I think is super valuable to us. So um, um, I think that in summary, I'm not looking for a service provider. I want a partner that actually can help me transform my business and continue with transformation of quality assurance. Um, and that can innovate actually with us while going to that transformation. Um, going back to that FIFA story uh, about you know amount of hours in, in, uh, uh, during development phase versus uh, once when the product is live, uh, I believe that the concept of uh, us buying mythical test tower is gone, is past. Uh, the contract that I uh, want to challenge our partners to come up with and actually the, inter the inter interface with us is not anymore uh, about testing hour. It is about output of that testing hour. So I don't want to buy hours. I want to buy data that then I can transform into that actionable intelligence or actionable insights to my development team. So again, what's the cost of the hour? I don't care. What I care about is the amount of data that I can get during development period. Did you want me to answer that one? Do you want to answer or I can ask <laughs> you to? Uh, I agree 100%. It's about relationships. Everything, everything we do is about relationships. But for us, it's uh, about quality, security, and then cost. If I had to rate those three things in that order. Because okay. I was going to, like, your special question, I guess, was like the one where generally the way that you've looked at your business when you run it is to build it yourself. So yes. there's that build or buy. Yes. But what was the decision for you to build rather than to work with so many? I know you do work with external partners, but generally, what was the decision? We do. I, yeah, I think there is no one solution for anything, right? That you're, we, we outsource, for example, uh, mobile work. Um, just because w I have no interest in buying every mobile device out there and holding you know, a, a compatibility lab full of that stuff. So it's easier uh, to give that to someone else. Um, but we have some languages, for example, on localization. We have five levels of localization. Uh, level one for us is 100% outsource. Uh, level five is 100% in-source. Uh, and we typically, um, there's usually business reasons why we uh, uh, go level one, uh, because our core tenant for localization is the best translator is someone who is a Blizzard employee. They bleed Blizzard blue, right? They understand. They're immersed in stories. I mean, you're just people that are geeked out about your stuff that are just sitting every day in meetings and being inundated with stuff are going to be that much better. And secondly, they have to sit in the region that they're supporting because ultimately want people to feel like the game, if they don't know Blizzard, was developed in the country that they uh, develop. So that's, those are our tenants. But with those tenants being like, if we achieve level five, uh, we do sometimes start with level one, which is completely outsourced. And it, but it's a, it's a business decision that we weigh a whole bunch of factors on before we do it. Quality assurance, same thing. We do outsource quality assurance sometimes. But the main reason why I got um, uh, started on this journey of, of bringing everything inside was mainly because I like being boot camp for development early on, and that was a mistake I made. I went from 30 people to 350 people in two years. Uh, couldn't find the right management team, and 80% at one point of my team all wanted to go to development. It's really hard to retain top talent when they all want to basically leave, and the dev teams are growing so quickly they just keep pick, pick. So about four years ago, I shifted just actually looking for quality professionals um, and pulling them into leadership roles and actually then grooming other people into it to give some stability. 
The main reason why we do it internally is because there still is that piece of wanting to grow those people. If you can train a future developer on the proper process of quality assurance, they're much better when they're uh, fixing bugs and they understand the plight that we go through. Um, but I do think that we, you have to have that if you're going to build the fifth element of development. Uh, you do that internally just like you would, like if the company isn't going to outsource art or design or engineering, why would they outsource QA, right? If it's truly the fifth element of development. So that's kind of where we're at and why we decided to do it. Okay. Thank you, gang. Thank you again. So hopefully, like I said at the beginning, this serves as like that evolution like, uh, from XDS, as you just talked about, sort of the other disciplines moving into, you know, expanding out on the service disciplines, what we discuss and like those common lessons learned. Thank you very much to the panel. Very, very grateful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Chris. <laughs>